Chapter Twenty Three of Korean Fairy Tales by William Elliot Griffiths. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Noel Badrian. Shoes for Hats. Many centuries ago, when Korea was named Cho Sen, or the land of morning splendor, the island kingdom out in the eastern sea, where the sun rises, was called the land of the dragonfly, which some foolish people call the devil's darning needle, because its body is so slender, its wings so wide, and its eyes so big. The Koreans called these islanders dwarfs, because they were not tall of stature, though they were very warlike and brave. The Islemen had no books or letters, and were very rude in their manners. Therefore, many kind teachers, filled with the spirit of great Buddha, crossed the sea from everlasting great Korea to teach these islanders politeness, and how to read and write, and to build pagodas and temples and schools. This is the reason why these islanders, who had no story-books or writing before the coming of the Korean teachers, have no ancient history of what happened long, long ago, when Korea was a great country. So the grandmothers in the islands used to tell their children the good old fairy tales which many elderly people know by heart, and can relate without reading, thinking that the kings and queens they talked about were real people, when they were only dreams. The islanders called their country the land where the day begins, and there are many fairies in these islands, some good, some bad. So today these island people make pictures in books, and plays on the stage, and movies about these Koreans. They get up tableaus and pageants to tell how first the fairies and the king's servants from these far-off islands long ago came to Korea. They wanted to learn politeness, how to make and wear the proper kind of clothes, and how to draw and paint, how to make pictures, how to build houses, how to dance and sing, and make music and play on instruments, how to teach and have schools for the good fairies always like to do pretty things yet instead of being grateful for what they had received from korea there was one of these island people a famous woman who was envious because she lived in a poor land while the koreans had a rich and beautiful country instead of swamps and grassy plains with plenty of wild beasts and birds and only a few people poor and miserable. Korea was rich in rice fields and orchards full of fruit. Flowers grew in plenty, birds, deer and rabbits were numerous in the mountains, and the scenery was beautiful. In the warm waters millions of fat fish swam and were easily caught. So the people had plenty of food to eat. Down along the bottom of the sea were most lovely water plants of rich colours, yellow, purple, green and white, with seaweeds, corals and sponges. In some of the sea caves lurked the giant crabs, cuttlefish and every sort of marine monster. Still further down, deeper than any line could fathom, dwelt the dragon king of the world under the sea and his queen, with genii and dragons and all her attendant maidens. These made sweet music, and there amid the mermaids the fairies had a happy time. These islanders had priests who went down by the seaside when the tide was low. There they called on the spirits of the deep to grant them a safe voyage, good luck, victory over the Koreans, and safe return. There they stood and watched the rippling waves as the breeze blew over the sea. The first living thing that poked its nose above the waters was the guardian of the seashore and the tides, called the salt water giant. He came up with his head all covered with clam and oyster shells, seaweed, shrimps, and whatever grows in the sand or bottom of the ocean. 
he had to push aside hundreds of white jellyfish that bumped against him as the clumsy old chap made his way up to the surface and then waded to the shore now this giant fairy was a grumpy sort of a fellow and seeing the queen and her soldiers he growled out what do you want very politely the queen's messenger made a soft answer to the big fellow and begged him to announce to his master the dragon king of the world under the sea that the queen wished him to help her would he please order all the great fish and every sea monster to go ahead and pull her ship forward would he also present her with the two sparkling tide jewels which govern the ebb and flood tides if he would do so then in the one case her enemies might be overwhelmed in the other case the ships of the koreans would be left high and dry on the shore then she could march through the country and get all the gold and gems and furs and jewels and clothes and nice things to eat and bring them back to her own country with the tide jewels in her hand she could certainly conquer and if you please one thing more added the messenger what else do you want growled the salt-water giant have your master the dragon king give our queen power to capture many hundreds of the korean artists craftsmen teachers and men of books and letters we shall make these men prisoners and bring them to our country and be civilized and what will you do in return to me and my master for all this roared the salt-water giant his voice was like a booming cannon for he was as mad as fire as soon as we get back safely to these shores our queen will build a temple in honor of the dragon king we shall burn incense to him and our people will pay him our devotions well then what else roared the salt-water giant there will be a shrine also dedicated to you my lord and we'll get the best korean artists to decorate it in wave patterns with drops of foam the salt-water giant bowed and disappeared with a tremendous splash down 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 he went to report to his master the dragon king of the world under the sea it was necessary for the dignity of his majesty that the queen and her soldiers should wait until flood tide for the dragon king never appeared except at high water so the queen's servant launched her ship and waited out on the waves for the answer they hoped to get no sooner did the tide mark on the sea beach show that the waves had reached the highest point of flood tide than the sea opened the white foam curled round the queen's ship while all on board held their breath to see what was coming they knew they would soon behold a sight to make them shiver for the great deep was mightily stirred first rose into view a terrible dragon's head on the helmet of the king it had eyes that seemed to flash fire then his majesty appeared in a great seashell as big as a bushel and held in both hands he had the two tight jewels these he presented to the queen and then quickly disappeared beneath the waves the last thing they saw was the dragon's head which besides the two eyes like lightning had teeth that could bite a boat in half even when full of men this monster could swallow down the whole crew in his mouth that was as wide as a man-eating shark's his enormous long black moustaches were as stout as ship's cables immediately after receiving the tied jewels the queen of the barbarians landed on the southern coast of korea after a few weeks having fought many battles with the koreans she made them bring to her their gold jewels furs fans rice and pretty things she and her people cared nothing about slaves or common prisoners but whenever and wherever they could find a painter an artist a costumer a maker of pottery or a man of books or a priest they seized and took him along 
they carried over with them to the island a great treasure of gems gold ornaments and pretty clothes they also took away many seeds of flowers and fruit trees such as lemons oranges apples and pears in the islands to which they came these smart men of skill and knowledge from korea taught the islanders who had lived like gypsies or indians how to build houses palaces and temples to make fine clothes to paint pictures and to be like the koreans and chinese who knew all about these things so the islands became rich in fruit rice grain pagodas and temples after this the island people wore lovely clothes and had fine manners now the islanders were great borrowers they invented very few things themselves but depended on their neighbors for much of what they had so they filled both their heads and pockets from what they had brought from korea but they often made funny mistakes when they wanted to learn about fine manners and fine clothes they asked what on solemn occasions and in time of ceremony they should put on their heads the koreans were greatly offended at these savages from over the sea for invading their country and taking away their artists and craftsmen so they now resolved to play a trick on the islanders so when men from the isles in the ocean sent a company of men to korea and asked for caps to put on their heads and be shown how to do things properly the koreans in contempt gave them their old shoes which had strings on them to tie over their feet but the islanders who loved to go about with little clothing on their backs and usually went barefoot did not know what these shoes were they thought these were some kind of headgear hats or bonnets so they put them on their heads like skull caps and tied them with the white strings down under their chins these were like tapes and held the caps on around their necks so to this day the islanders when making offerings to the fairies wear this headgear and think their shoe caps are very fine end of shoes for hats